Hello everybody, here's a story that's about as shocking as sitting on a jar. Now, to be fair, I actually covered this story before, but just like Taylor Swift redoing her Christmas albums, I think I could do this story better this time around. Now, the story is about a country that you've never heard about. However, the Global Hunger Index had indicated that this country is the worst in the world for children. No, I'm not talking about North Korea or Syria or China or Russia. I'm talking about the Central African Republic. Now, about as sure as night turns to day and day burns all the white people, what we can say for sure is it's called the Central African Republic because it is located in the center of Africa. So today we're going to read through a satanic laundry list of all of their problems to better understand how we can help the situation. And I don't mean help as in like air quotes help like Iraq. I mean help as in a non-psychopathic serial killer kind of way. So the topics that we're going to dive into deeper than Kim Kardashian did on Ray J include famine, scary hospitals, Mad Max styled militias, a homeless population that's honestly larger than anything you've probably ever heard about, History, obviously how the U.S. squeezed its willy into an unwarranted situation, and how Russia had snuck into the back. Now, if you're listening so far and I haven't made you cry thus far, it means I'm probably not doing my job, so I'm going to throw out a startling statistic. 1.5 million children are on the verge of starvation in the Central African Republic. And by on the verge, by the way, I had a troll be like, what dictates on the verge? It means if they go another week, they're going to die. Now, to repeat what I just said, in case some of y'all are actually slipping, I'm going to add a little bit more detail. So between 2018 Global Hunger Index and 2019, not 2020, by the way, because apparently they didn't have any information on that. What we learned was that the Central African Republic was rated the worst in the world. Now, for those of you who are wondering, what exactly is the Global Hunger Index? What does it do? Well, it actually tracks the level of malnutrition like Chris Hansen tracks predators. For perspective, You'll find more food in the gutters of North Korea than you would in this place. Just so you know. Now, allow me to actually humanize this bitch for all of y'all. One reason why this is one of the worst places in the world is because the U.S. has more McDonald's per block than this country has pediatric hospitals across the whole country. Now, this isn't a small country, by the way. It's over the size of Texas. And the number of pediatric hospitals they have is a combined total of well, one. Now, the pediatric hospital's name is Bangi, and I apologize if I butchered that like Jeffrey Dahmer, but essentially it's a single story building with 300 beds and one single ambulance. That means if more than one newborn has a serious emergency and a hospital is needed, specifically an ambulance, you better hope to God the ambulance is closer to you than the other person who needs it as well. Now, this country is so poor and overcrowded that it's common for as many as three sickly children to share a single bed, which by the way, that gives me anxiety because I have anxiety when somebody sits on my bed sheets, let alone sharing a hospital with two other people who are also sick. Meanwhile, in America, we all know somebody who gets all stressed out and has a mental breakdown whenever the Starbucks lady messes up their peppermint macchiato, okay? I think we can all agree on this, right? Let's all just <sighs> take a pause because the next story is gonna hit harder than a raccoon looking for coke. 75 to 80% of the country is lawless. And by lawless, what I mean is it's not governed by a sovereign state. Basically, imagine a band of rabid Karens taking over different swaths of land until they're mass murdered and then a different band of Karens go and take over that different pieces of land. And the government essentially controls the capital and that's more or less it. In terms of international perspective, there's UN peacekeepers, However, despite the fact there's 14,000 of them, they do kind of act like that friend that kind of wants to help out their friend who's throwing hands in a Walmart parking lot, but he doesn't really like to throw hands himself. And so he kind of posts up in the corner until someone pulls out a phone and he's like, oh shit, I actually have to do something now. So he kind of symbolically throws a couple punches and that's about it. It's pretty much what the UN is doing. They're not helping a whole lot, but they're there, if that counts for something. Side note, when I said a band of rabid Karens, what I actually mean is 14 different rebel groups that are controlling different types of territories in the Central African Republic. Also, for the record, I don't actually consider these rebel-controlled areas to be civil and maintain some sort of law and order. The reason actually is pretty simple. For once in life, there's actually a simple reason. It's because the humanitarian workers who oversee these types of regions, they're just mass murdered. So we have no idea what happens in these areas. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna go even further with this. I'm gonna say the humanitarian aid workers are targeted more than Britney Spears is from her dad. According to NBC, in 2018, there is 396 attacks against humanitarian aid workers, despite the fact there's only 365 days out of the year. Now look, I like a train run through me just as much as the next straight guy, but this seems a little bit excessive. 
Oh, also, just to kind of tickle your pickle here, they also target people of different religious orientations or different religious practices or beliefs, however you want to categorize that. So I don't really know if you are a humanitarian aid worker and also part of a different religion. I don't know if they just kill you twice or in hindsight, I suppose they probably just keep you for ransom, but that's aside the point. But I think you gain a perspective about what exactly is going on in this country. Okay, so the Central African Republic is an orgy of destruction going up in a fireball of flames, and I don't mean the fireball is in the type of alcohol. Nothing could possibly get any worse, right? Nah, son. Nah, we're about to go harder than some white chicks at Amigos concert up in here. Let's get into the number of displaced people. So more than a million people are displaced from war. This includes people who are internally displaced or externally displaced. The war has also claimed tens of thousands of lives. Here is why this statistic is a painful pinch to the side of you swallowing emotional trauma. There's about 4.7-ish million people in the country, which means about a fourth you know, about a fourth to a fifth, roughly, of the people in the country are either displaced or they're dead. Like, look, <laughs> I don't mean to be like a classic American. I definitely don't want to be like a classic capitalist here. But if I was given two options, like a McDonald's or something like that, I'd be pretty pissed. Really quick, I'm going to stop the program and let you guys know, if you don't feel bad about the millions of people that are dying, don't feel too bad because of the fact that there's something called psychic numbing. Now, what that is, is where you're you have an inability to be able to process that level of suffering. Your brain is incapable of doing that. You can process the level of suffering for one person or two or three, but the more people that are suffering, the harder it is to comprehend that level. So in order for us to better understand this situation, I'm going to paint a picture like the Bob Ross of death. The amount of people who are homeless and dead, one or the other, or eventually both, that is the number of people who live in Seattle and an additional 300,000. So that's the number of people who live in Seattle and 10 football stadiums worth of people who are dead. And yet nobody knows about this country. Now, if you're feeling as depressed as Kashi69 probably did after his last album flop, don't worry, there's some good news in all of this story. But I have one last hard fact that's about as off-putting as the thought of Ted Cruz impregnating you. Sorry. I didn't mean to give you that visual, but now you have it. 2.9 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. And other needs, 2.9 million people need about as much help as Kanye. So Christ on a cracker. How do we get here? What is going on? Where do we move forward? Because right now it feels like life is going in dry and hard and rocking us from the back and we're not really liking it, but our back is getting blown out regardless. But don't worry. Follow me on this next part. Let's go into the history. I'm not going to go too far into the history of the Central African Republic, but it is important to touch on a little bit of it. So it started as a slave trade area where it placed one group in power over another. Pretty standard stuff in this region. However, for our purposes, let's start between 2004 and 2007. There is a peace agreement after the Civil War in that particular time. However, there's this group called the Selica Muslims, which I probably butchered the holy bejesus out of that name, but the Selica Muslims believe that the government didn't respect the peace agreement, and then all the shit went down. In 2012, an armed coalition of Selica Muslims, primarily made up of, go figure, the country's Muslim minority, which is why they're called the Selica Muslims, they took the capital of Bangui and staged a coup in March 2003. However, in response, the Christians and these individuals called the animists, which animists are people who believe in like non-human entities and spiritual entities, kind of like the inner power of animals and plants and inanimate objects and believing that they all have a spiritual essence. And I apologize if you're an animist and I just destroyed your entire religion on accident there. But the Christians and the animists who call themselves the anti-Balakas began throwing more heat than a ginger's fist against the Selica Muslims. Subsequently, tons of people died, have been displaced. We know the whole story. So then the refugees are primarily Muslim who had fled to Cameroon and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thus, here we are right now. Not everything in the story sucks. Sometimes it swallows, which at times can be a good thing. But there's a fascinating food that the... <laughs> I didn't mean to lead in with talking about food, by the way. There's a fascinating food that the United Nations is sponsoring and they're buying mass products of. It's called Plumpy Nut. It's a peanut butter on steroids. The food is about as needed as Jake Paul needs to catch more hands than Jeffrey Dahmer. It's a very important type of food. One bar, otherwise known as one packing, can keep a kid alive for an entire day. Now, the United Nations 
has given this to 25,500 kids who are on the brink of death. And by brink of death, I mean their organs are currently shutting down. Fortunately, 90% had recovered, which is absolutely amazing. With that said, if you would like to donate or share this information, I have more in the description box of This Is YouTube. Otherwise, you can look up UNICEF, Plumpy Nut, and call it good. On behalf of the kids, I can say thank you for giving a shit. Like any traumatic story, the U.S. has a place at the table like an alcoholic has a bottle at their child's birthday. Have you guys ever heard of an individual named Joseph Coney, otherwise known as, oh my God, Joseph Coney 2012. We got to share it on our Facebooks and our Instagrams and our MySpaces to hope to God to spread awareness of the situation. If you have no idea what I'm talking about. You're either one, too young to know about it, or two, you realize it's about as useless as saying praying for and then insert some country that's dealing with a catastrophe as opposed to actually donating to the cause. Yeah, by the way, I will recognize the fact that my salt game is about as strong as a thick boy's under boob sweat during the middle of a buffet, but that's just how it is. I'm a little salty towards Facebook posts that really lead to nowhere sometimes, like in this case. Follow me on this. So as a background, Joseph Kony is a sicko from Uganda who the United States was after, and this is pretty good leeway actually into the Central African Republic. So just hear me out on this. I'm gonna take us through a rabbit hole like Wizard of Oz, but probably a worse ending. So Joseph Coney killed at least 10,000 people, abducted about 24,000 individuals, specifically kids, and displaced millions between 1986 and 2009-ish. By the way, Buddy became a serial killer when he was 25, which is kind of a fun fact. But anyway, his affairs bled into the Central African Republic and the US was by default looking at him and thus created operations in the Central African Republic. In other words, they were searching for him harder than the police were looking for OJ's knife. While all of this was going down between 2012 and 2014, the US suspended embassy operations because well, there was an actual literal coup, so it's kind of hard to do business in that area. As we tiptoed through 2014, it ended up being about as bad as watching Jerry Springer in the middle of a gunfight. The U.S. supported the United Nations with a peacekeeping operation to create stability in their quest to find Kony. However, in 2017, so just a couple of years later, the U.S. gave up looking for him because they figured he probably only has about 100 fighters left and it's not worth their effort, which is really ironic, by the way, for the U.S. to say, because when have they ever stopped pursuing somebody who only has about 100 fighters. Al-Qaeda, I'm looking at you right now. My hypothesis on this is they realized Kony didn't have oil, so they had to X out of their incognito mode and realized they had to move on to a different product that interests them a little bit more. Though it sounds like the U.S. is about as finished as waking up in a stranger's bedroom, realizing that you're going to have to ghost them the following day, but it turns out we're not exactly done with the country just yet. Plot twist, according to the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. gave over $300 million in, quote, humanitarian development and security assistance. In other words, we literally became gold diggers when we realized our SO had some financial currency. I get it. We're giving them money, but it's called an quote unquote investment in the U.S. government eyes. You'll see what I'm talking about. With that funding, we had funded a handful of programs created by U.S. aid that are focused on assisting, emphasis on quote unquote assisting with mining diamonds and gold in a peace building effort. God, doesn't that just sound like the most U.S. basic bitch food group topped with a doppling of shit that I've ever heard. So on point though, US, so on point. Now, I don't wanna wear a tinfoil hat or seem like a Karen bitch and out of bitch and party, but considering the fact that 75% of the country is lawless, how do you think these rebel groups receive their funding? And also, who is the United States doing business with? Now I get it. I'm hinting around the sides of something very significant, so I'm gonna go ahead and say it. More than likely, the US companies are paying rebel factions off for blood diamonds. There, I said it. Now you get what I'm trying to say here. And I know, by the way, I'm sorry, this truth, probably feels like a non-consensual kick to the groin. But not to be more skeptical than the war in Iraq, but if humanitarian workers are being targeted and the most of the country is lawless, then how do you expect to create peace other than buying off these rebel factions? So what are you gonna do, send more humanitarian workers in there? I don't think that was their plan. Look, I'm not always philosophical, but I'm gonna give it a shot. The bar is set so low for the United States right now that what we really need to do is spread information, first of all, so people even know that this country even exists, and then also know what our role inside of this country is. So go ahead and spread this information like gossipy sorority girls in the middle of a party, okay? Thank you. And on behalf of everybody, I'd like to say thanks. And if you would like to take a step forward in this direction, perhaps skip your next tender date, aka your next bad decision, and donate that money to save a kid's life. I don't know, maybe. Maybe it'll help your karmic balance as well. Who knows? 
I hate to say it, but a lot of news can't really be said without mentioning Russia or the United States. It kind of seems like both of those countries get all of the attention, like a couple having an argument in the middle of a party. In 2017, during a United Nations General Assembly meeting, and a plot twist that honestly was deeper than your fundamentalist Christian uncle coming out as gay, the Central African Republic reached out to the Russians of all people for assistance. Now let me tell you why this is weird. As a background, France has been helping the country since they decided to decolonize. Central African Republic was a huge slave trade area where they put one group in front of the other, thus creating the conflict that we have today. Despite the fact that the Central African Republic had deep ties with France, they were kind of stuck in a weird quasi-relationship between France and literally any other country that was willing to help. Essentially, it was very similar to Twilight between the zombie guy and the werewolf guy who ended up kind of looking honestly like a hairless naked mole rat when he wasn't a werewolf. I'm just saying, you'd have imagined him to be a little bit hairier for a werewolf in his human form. I don't mean to be too skeptical about the movie. I've only seen it a whopping zero times sober, but you get what I'm trying to say. Anyway, back to the story. The UN meeting was essentially the period of time when Russia decided to pop its overly aggressive head into the situation. The conversation between the Central African Republic and Russia went like this. Hey, can you guys give us a help? Russia said, okay. That's it. The end. I just summarized that. You can pay me for it later. Now, it sounds like all of this is coming out of left field from American perspective, but it isn't really. Now, I'm voluntarily going to choose to skip on a lot of the details between the dynamics between Russia and the Central African Republic because it's kind of like a side mission that runs on too long. So I'm going to act like Kendra Sunderland going to college, pull out real quick, and I'm going to do my own thing. With that said, it appears that we have a potential problem. Russia is becoming highly influential in the Central African Republic, and the U.S. is the leading donator to the Central African Republic. So there's a direct competition. It's kind of like a stripper who has a boyfriend in the crowd supplemented with a sugar daddy that's making it rain in real time. My point is you can imagine all of the competition that this creates. Let's talk about Russia's exact involvement, because are they acting like the classic American man and going to Thailand for vacation, quote unquote? Or are they actually trying to make a difference? Or are they pulling a US against Iraq situation? Well, I do have an answer. The story of Russia pretty much goes like this. Because of the fighting and coup in 2012, in 2013, the UN said nobody give weapons to the Central African Republic because you're obviously going to assist in the issues in that area. Who would have thought? However, in an odd twist of fate, the United Nations approved Russia to be the only country in the world to be able to give the Central African Army weapons. To put this in other terms, the former Soviet Union led by a former KGB operative, they are the only ones allowed to give weapons during a civil war. Do you guys feel as weird about the situation as I do? Look, I'm not just trying to bust the Russians crackers here. Whatever the Russians can do, the US can do better and that includes stealing resources. I'm just saying. The real question here is why is Russia here? Russia claims they're responding to a request for help by the Central African Republic. Apparently Russia is just so overwhelmingly nice, specifically the government, that they're just like a big handful of butterflies throwing up glitter and sitting on unicorn horns. They're just so dandy. But, and I do mean a butt that's thicker than the circumference of Nicki Minaj's fake booty, the two countries do in fact have an agreement that allows Russia to begin a quote unquote mining exploration. And there we go. I don't mean to be sipping tea here, but I did know that there was something. That's all I'm saying. But this does raise a lot of questions, though, about what kind of a relationship Russia has with the Central African Republic. Is it charitable? Is it exploitive? Or is it kind of like a symbiotic, mutually beneficial, kind of like the number six and nine? Well, in classic Russian fashion, they gave us somewhat of an answer, but not quite. They claim that it is a mutually beneficial, otherwise known as not charitable in nature. Also, fun fact, by the way, this individual whose name I definitely can't pronounce, his name is Valery Zakharov. He's a former Russian intelligence officer. He actually works for the president of the Central African Republic. So what I'm trying to say is they're paired up harder than the Weeboo kids in class. Now, look, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer here, but I do have one final question, and that is who is benefiting from this type of symbiotic six and nine level relationship? Because considering the fact that the majority of the country is controlled by warlords, I have a feeling that the majority of the people in the country will not be reaping the rewards from this. It's probably going to be profited by the warlords, and that's probably about it. And that sucks. And spits. So look, here's what I don't want to have happen. I don't want the United States to take one side, Russia to take another within the civil war itself, and try to exploit the country as much as humanly possible. We've seen this in Syria, Vietnam, North Korea, kind of Afghanistan. Do I need to continue? I think we get the point. Unfortunately, we, we don't actually have a lot of information about the relationship between Russia and the United States within the Central African Republic. However, what we can say is that I personally haven't received any news that a World War III has broken out. So I'll take that win. 
I'll take it where I can. Overall, the point here is that the Central African Republic is a country that not a lot of people know. However, they are one of the worst off countries in the world, and therefore it is very important to know. Right now, it feels like they're being exploited more than the Oompa Loompas in the Willy Wonka Chocolate Factory. And I have a problem with that. And I think a lot more people should be aware of the role of their country within this country itself, if that makes any sense at all. But anyway, if you guys would like to follow me, I have a Rockfin, YouTube, Twitter, a Patreon. It's all the Zach Moss show. Please contribute to independent media because I'm too ugly for OnlyFans. Thank you.